this talk is great projects start with great RFPs. Uh, we're going to uh, come right into, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Joe Crespo. Um, I've been with Atten for seven years now, but I've been building websites for 20 years. Uh, my career trajectory is I started as a graphic designer, became a web designer, became a web developer, then a technical account manager, then a project manager. And today, the last uh, three years at Atten, I've been doing sales. Uh, um, but the, the truth is, is that I spend a lot of time onboarding clients and project, doing project planning, and I, that means I do a lot of time, spend a lot of time reading RFPs or requests for proposals. Um, this talk is about basically built out of all of the experience I've had reading great RFPs and poor RFPs. And I really want to <clears throat> just sort of share some tactical approaches to both. Uh, but before I get into writing a great RFP, I want to differentiate between the RFP, the document, and the RFP, the process, that often accompanies the document. Um, the RFP process, if you're not familiar with it, is usually employed by public sector clients or large organizations uh, where a program team within the organization needs a new website or new brand or new strategy, and they then go to a buying team or a procurement team with a procurement officer and uh, uh, the procurement officer helps them with the RFP process. They handle all the communication, the team, and the potential partners. This is the process I'm referring to. And the process has some serious issues that we need to overcome in the RFP document. And here's what I mean. This is, um, this is Brian Pullen, co-founder of Playground. It's an agency, digital agency. Uh, the RFP, 50 plus page document, has little information. It's a waste of time and money. Um, I want to just point out that this is conflating the document with the process. The issue here isn't the document. The issue here is, is that there is a 50 plus page document that's trying to overcome the process and it's not doing it successfully. And so I, I'm reminded when I think about these long, long RFPs, I'm reminded of the Mark Twain quote, was, uh, I apologize for such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. You know, I mean, th these documents need to be concise and help you explain your project to very various partners. And, you know, not to harp on the process, but I do want to just say, you know, Forbes just hates the, the RFP process. They have a number of articles. And again, they are also, their headlines are conflating RFP the document with RFP the process. And let's just talk about the criticism of the RFP process. One, it is inefficient. Um, whether you are working with an agency that is fixed priced or time and materials or value priced, a part of the cost that agency uh, uh, <clears throat> passes on to the clients is the cost of acquisition, the cost of acquiring clients. And so we all know that we pay our, our partners for the time they spend on our projects. Uh, part of the time that they spend on that project is acquiring the project. And so we're also paying our partners for the time they spend acquiring projects. Um, this isn't a Joe Crespo original. This was actually came up out of Cal Harrison's talk, Five Billion Reasons to Change the RFP, in which he calls the process sand in the engine of the economy. Um, if you have a chance, if it's 25 minutes, uh, it's a great YouTube video. He, I really can't do it justice. It's a really, really well thought out uh, talk. The issue with the RFP process is that it's impersonal and it's designed to be impersonal. It makes sense that it is impersonal. The RFP process is designed to level the playing field, remove favoritism, remove nep nepotism, and you know, basically, which requires that it's impersonal. And it makes sense that it's designed that way, but it's not designed to procure creative work. And in, in digital work, whether it's you know purely design or development, is all creative work. It is built on the back of great communication and collaboration. And this process is actually something that works against that. And, you know, finally, the process is owned by a buyer who is mostly interested in the logistical elements of a project, which means that the process itself tends to value price over quality and innovation. And let me tell you what I mean. If I were in a hypothetical situation, if I'm asked to build a blog, and I can ask no follow-up questions, just build a blog. 
the first thing I'm going to think of is think of a project on a scale of small to large. Or in contextually speaking, thinking about blogs, I'm going to think of it in scale of medium to snowfall. And what I mean by this is if we need this blog to be super fast, if, if time and budget are of the essence on this blog build, then the best solution is to go to medium and create a blog. If you could do it in 15 minutes, you could stand it up before the top of the hour. It costs very little, but it's a practical solution in, you know, with a very narrow short term view, this is a very practical solution. The long term, you know, you're, this does not support your brand. This supports Medium's brand. This, do, you do not control the flow of this page. Medium does. And you are subject to Medium's ever changing terms and conditions. But it is practical for some applications. On the, this is the medium side of the scale. This is the small end of the scale. Let's talk about Snowfall, the large end of the scale. For everybody who's not familiar with Snowfall, this was a single blog post, one blog post on the New York Times. They spent over a thousand hours on this one blog post. This is launched in, I believe, 2014. And what they, why they made this investment is they really wanted to stretch their legs. They wanted to show the world what a web page could do. And they wanted to show the world what long form writing could do. And they did all of the UX things that we've become so familiar with because so many websites have borrowed from Snowfall since then. Uh, embedded video in the background, parallax scrolling, chunked content, so much of what we see online today is inspired by this one blog post. And so why, why is this important to you? I'm not the New York Times. I don't have to publish long form content. What was important here is that New York Times is looking to innovate. And just like Atten has to innovate, just like your organization has to innovate, every organization has to innovate. And the RFP process values practical over innovation or values really values medium over snowfall. And so the first piece of advice I have in writing an RFP document is to try to avoid the process, if you can. I know it can't always be helped. I know a lot of uh, organizations really have this requirement baked in. Um, but whether or not you are gonna go through the process, write the RFP, write the document. And so the rest of this talk is really gonna be focused on how this document can really inform your, your agency partners and how it can also be used to overcome some of the shortcomings in the process itself. So uh, we're a user-centered agency. Uh, we're going to first think the, the way we design an RFP is what's its purpose? Why do you need this RFP? And so let's think about the goals of an RFP. Well, the first one is to select a great partner. A great partner is not necessarily the best. The great partner is the best possible fit for the engagement that you have. And so you need to make sure that you can describe this engagement in a way that all of these partners out in the, out in the ether can understand whether or not we get a sense of whether or not they will be that great partner. The second uh, purpose of an RFP is to codify the issues you need to solve. There's a, 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 great, a great quote, and I, I can't remember who said it, which is like, a, you know, idea, uh, your head is the worst place to store your ideas. Writing them down codifying them gives you a, a sense of what the problems you're trying to solve. It also really surfaces the second order issues much more clearly. And it does a third thing, which is gets your stakeholders into alignment. I think, you know, in the opening slides during the, the uh, when you first arrived at the webinar, there was a slide that said digital projects are risky. And they are. Um, and one way to mitigate risk is to make sure you get your stakeholders all together um, and, and all of this ultimately is get all of your stakeholders together into alignment on what, growing together on what this project is going to deliver. Ultimately, all of this is about setting your project up for success. Make it visible to your stakeholders, codify the problems, and select a great partner. And to that end, I want to just step away from the world of digital and websites and branding and all of that. And I want to think about Van Halen and m and ms And this is just an example that I, I like to think of when, when thinking about organizing an RFP. And that is, and when I say Van Halen, I really do mean this Van Halen, this the, the, the rock group from the 80s. 
Now, I've never been a fan, but I do understand that, you know, back in their heyday, their shows were a spectacle. They had, you know, they toured coast to coast. They had two tractor trailers with all their equipment. You see the lasers and lights and smoke machines and pyrotechnics and whatever this rig is as well, flying this guy around arenas, you know, and they had a rider going into each venue that was 90 page long, 90 pages long to make sure everything was, that they had the electrical that they needed, that everything was safe. You know, you don't want the pyrotechnics pointed at the band or the audience. So there's a lot of precision rigging that needed to go into each and every one of these shows. And so on their 90 page rider, they had a brilliant idea. And a lot of you may know this. They said on page 62, buried somewhere, they said, in our dressing rooms, we expect to see a bowl of M&Ms with all of the brown M&Ms removed. The idea was the band members would arrive at the venue, they'd go to their dressing room, they'd look for a bowl of M&Ms. If there was no bowl of M&Ms or if there were brown M&Ms in the bowl, they knew immediately the, the promoter had not read the writer thoroughly. And they then went to DEF CON 1 checking all the rigging to make sure. They also, since it was written into the writer, they felt like, oh, well, I can just cancel this. Uh, this the, the promoter didn't honor our agreement. I can cancel this, uh, this concert without any penalty. So they thought of this as just as a brilliant idea, but, but really was it a brilliant idea? I want to think about this for a moment. <clears throat> Stepping into this dressing room in the 80s, the decision maker as to whether or not the promoter had made a safe venue and environment for the band is this guy. This guy who is uh, not, really, not fully dressed. <laughs> he's got like five bottles of liquor in front of him. He's got a huge spectacle that he's got to put on in front of uh, screaming fans, completely distracted. This is not the decision maker that you want in this. Uh, working, working the angles here. So was this really a, a brilliant idea or a clever trick? Because I would argue, just imagine you're a fan in the late 80s, standing on the field in the Meadowlands Arena, and over the loudspeaker, someone says, the show has been canceled because Eddie Van Halen doesn't like the M&Ms we supply. Uh, no matter what kind of a super fan you were before that announcement, you were done being a, a fan. This is actually not actionable. So it was a clever trick. And it's a clever trick that buried essential requirements. Now you might be saying, well, this is just a, this is a writer and this is a rock band and I'm, not, I, I'm talking about writing an RFP and I'm not a rock band. But your RFP is gonna, you may have to include legalese that will bury the essential requirements of your project. Or you have to include boilerplate. Your organization has some things that they require you put in the RFP that's going to bury your essential requirements. As you gather input from your stakeholders, you're gonna get great ideas and you get not so great ideas and you really need to share what those priorities are because non-essential requirements can bury your essential requirements. So what we really wanna do is we wanna make sure that we're creating something that is really concise and makes sense for your users. So let's talk about how we're preparing for getting the RFP together. First, do your homework. And yes, this is a platitude. Let's move on to the actual actionable tax tasks. The first piece of homework for writing an RFP is to get input from key stakeholders. Everyone wants to weigh in on the project. And the more you, you get people to get buy-in on the project, the more visible your project is, the higher priority it is for your organization, and higher priority projects mitigate risk. Also, it gives you a very clear sense of what parts of your project are of keen interest to your stakeholders. Uh, maybe you have uh, people who run events and they want to make sure that when that event section gets, gets written, that's getting written to their needs, or so on. The second is before you issue an RFP, pre-qualify vendors. This is uh, really helpful in a number of, 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 of ways. First, it's, it's a free consultation for you from a bunch of people who build these things or design these things all the time. 
And so by meeting with them, you can get a good sense of what is uh, what is the, the budget range you should be thinking about, the timeline you should be thinking about. You'll get some good ideas for the scope, some user experience ideas. That's really helpful. And then when it, it but also it helps you identify people that you might want to work with as opposed to just throwing the RFP out into the universe and seeing what comes back. And the next one is, is that, you know, I keep on harping on risk, but mitigating risk, uh, digital projects are risky and the larger they get, the riskier they get. And so the way to mitigate that risk is to break it into small pieces. It's really common for when discussions happen around, hey, maybe we should retheme the website. Oh, wait a minute, the website's on an older platform. Maybe we should re-platform the website before we retheme it. Wait a minute, the content on that site is old. So we, maybe you should do a content audit before we re-platform and retheme it. Wait a minute and go on and so on and so forth. If you find yourself in that situation, break this project up into small pieces. Even if you intend to work with the same vendor on all of it, it's really helpful to just break it down into bite-sized pieces. So what needs to be in your RFP? First, we wanna know about your, back, your project background. And what do I mean by this? I want to know your organization's mission. We, you know, so many organizations, small and large, will have a mission statement, they'll have values, they'll have something that they're trying to accomplish generally, whether they're nonprofit or a commercial. We want to know what that mission is because that's going to inform a part of this project. We also want to know about this project's history. If it's a website, is this a new website, like brand new, Greenfield, or is this a migration from a previous platform? If, if it's a branding engagement, how long has the brand been around? If it's a strategic, well, tell me, tell me about your analytics. I want to know about the history of this project so that I can help guide, guide you forward. The next is, and this is really important, why is this important to your organization? Like what goals is your organization going to achieve by the successful completion of this project? This is a basically, we want to know what success looks like and why it's important. And then finally, we want to know about your users. Why, why are they going to care about the thing we're going to build with you? This is a, we're a user-centered design shop. We're really feedback driven and we strongly encourage our clients to think about their users as they make key decisions. The second is to make requirements clear. The scope of work section should be its own section in the proposal, full stop. It should be clearly labeled scope of work. But I want to talk about some pointers on clarity. First, prescriptive solutions are limiting. This can be good and this can be bad. Let me give you a, good, a couple of good examples of good limiting prescriptive solutions. One is, um, we want to launch this uh, platform on Drupal. Well, now we know the CMS. We don't have to make any, take any moments to think about what CMS we're going to be using. Or we're hosted on pa Pantheon. We're going to continue to be hosted on Pantheon. Well, well, that's great. We don't have to think about anything about the, the web host. And in fact, that informs some of our technical planning. Prescriptive solutions can be limiting and they can limit the scope and scale of your project, but they can also be limiting if you're too prescriptive. And what I mean by too prescriptive is if your RFP goes right down to the task level, I want you to create, I'll give you an example. I met with a client and they, their RFP had three line items for the homepage. It was carousel, create a carousel. Um, we want to <coughs> uh, <laughs> create a carousel. We want our Twitter feed surfaced and we want uh, the three latest news articles posted on our homepage. Um, now, None of that took into account that uh, the Twitter feed is uh, supplied by a, an inline JavaScript that is a blocking JavaScript going to slow down the page performance. It's going to have a negative impact on SEO. Uh, the, the carousel, the analytics on carousels are really bad. Um, they, they don't actually increase user engagement on the site. Most users, if they do click on the carousel, will click on the first slide. Uh, but the carousels also typically has accessibility issues, adds a lot of payload to the page. Uh, some carousel libraries will block the uh, performance of the page, and so on. And then, of course, the, the, head, the, the, the news was the third thing. When I had a chance to talk to them about it, what I learned was that they wanted this carousel because they have six departments, and they, all wanted, they, they, they didn't want to have a political fight over who gets on the homepage. There are other solutions for that. 
when we talked about Twitter, it was really just about increasing social media engagement. And when we talked about the news articles, this was about making sure that the homepage was fresh. And when people came back, they saw new stuff and that they knew the organization was a living, breathing thing. Prescriptive solutions in those instances were not taking into account the overarching goal. They were just like, this is what, how we're going to achieve the goal. We want to help you achieve the goal. And we want to make sure that we understand those goals. So when you talk about requirements, talk about what you envision will be the project outcomes. What, what does success look like for you? And also, what are your priorities? And just going back to the medium through snowfall example, you know, if you are a, 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 an organization and you just want to experiment and see if blogging is going to be a good, a good uh, resource for you, then maybe medium is a good place to start to see if that's a good small experiment to start with. But if you are a publishing platform, medium is going to be just absolutely wrong for you. We, we want to know your priorities. What is the most important thing to the least, the, the, the most important to the least important. And so it's great to have the must haves and the nice to haves in the, in the, uh, in the RFP. And I think the last thing is really a logistical thing uh, for the RFP process itself, if you are going through a process, which is what are the scoring metrics? Uh, I've seen uh, RFP processes where they don't share how they're va evaluating the RFPs, the proposals themselves. And it's very hard for me to understand what's important to the organization. Like I, is, is if, if I know that there's 100 points that are going to be scored and 50 of them are going to be budget, I'm going to know that budgets are the most important thing to you. Conversely, if you say experience is worth 50 points, that's what I'm, I, I'm going to know. I also want to know about your timeline and why. And the why is important. I think the first piece, everybody gets right which is to be clear about the submission deadlines. It's very rare that I read an RFP that doesn't have a date associated with when, I, when they expect to get questions and when they expect to see proposals. There's a lot of RFPs often have that information, but what they typically often omit is what's the project's timeline? Is it being, what's it being driven by? Is there an upcoming campaign or a grant deadline? We want to know. Because we want to make, also want to make sure that the timeline is it informed by level of effort. Meaning, if you did pre-qualify before issuing an RFP, were you asking those questions about the level of effort that those agencies saw? So it would be really helpful when you create the timeline to really, first of all, to share this timeline, um, what, you, what the ideal timeline is. And if you're not, if there is no ideal timeline or if you're not sure, I, being very transparent in the RFP is helpful for me. The next is for those who have to go through an RFP process. You will have to, you will see uh, in the RFP process, especially from large organizations or public sector organizations, you'll see um, a, a sample contract included in the RFP. You'll see insurance requirements included in the RFP. You'll see uh, some forms that need to be filled out with affidavits and notarized as attached to the RFP. Separate all of that out. You know, first, don't assume it's necessary. Uh, it, it, pushing back on this internally before issuing the RFP, I've seen, I've seen uh, clients successfully remove boilerplate from their RFP and just issue like a five page document. So first, just don't assume that it's necessary, but if you do have to include it, make liberal use of appendices. And what I mean is, is that if you do have to include the sample contract and recurrence insurance requirements and some forms that need to be filled out, put them in appendix A, B, and C. Move them away from the description of the project itself. Uh, you know, on the flip side, you know, perhaps you're working with a procurement team that has an RFP template and they just, they just want to drop your scope right into page three of their template. In that instance, flip the script and basically on page three, say, go see Appendix A for scope of work. And on, under timeline, go see Appendix B for, scope, for timeline. Move, it, it's not important whether or not the uh, boilerplate and scope is in the appendix or in the body of the document. What's important is that they're separate. This next one is uh, a logistical thing that is unbelievably important. And that is make the PDFs, the RFPs are typically issued as a PDF document. And PDFs can be uh, uh, text-based or image-based. Text-based images, the text-based PDFs are searchable and image-based are not. 
Uh, actually, it's it's so. I mean, the first thing I do when I reach a look at an RFP, I don't read it cover to cover. Is I I scan it, I search it, I look for look for terms and, and words that are meaningful to me. It's actually kind of embarrassing. I had I was just talking to a client that we just won a project with um, uh, recently, and uh, I was I was doing like the the after action debrief, and what I learned was um, that the first thing he did or many of the people in the selection committee did was they jumped straight to the case studies on the, on the uh, proposal. And his, his reasoning when he shared it with me was if the case study work wasn't good, then the rest of the proposal doesn't matter. So we don't read our, each other's documents top to bottom. We scan them first, figure out if it's worth a, a time investment, and then we read them top to bottom. That's essentially how, how people work. And I want to make sure the last point is, is that, the tone of your RFP is going to be mirrored. People are going to respond to your organization. This RFP is going to be an introduction to your organization to many, many agencies are gonna first learn about your organization through your RFP. And they're going to try to mirror the tone of your RFP. Now, if your RFP is, um, I've seen RFPs that are jumble of copy paste mess, uh, uh, copy pasta is what it's called. The, Example that I'm thinking of is there was one where there was a, a literally within the same clause of the RFP, there was a requirement for three months support, and then there was a requirement for six months report support, and then there was a requirement for 12 months support. And all they done was just basically copied, co copied tech content from one RFP to another and just made a mess. Uh, I would, I, they're going to get, if they're, if the RFPs copy pasta, the proposals will mirror them. So make sure that the RFP is really well thought so that the proposals are also really well thought. Something that needs to be in the RFP, and this is very often omitted from an RFP, is to talk about your team. I wanna know what uh, superpowers you're bringing to a project. I wanna know who the people are on the team. What are their skills? Uh, it's great to know that you have a copywriter or a marketer on your team. It's good to know if you have a developer who's a seasoned WordPress developer or is very new to Drupal. It helps me put together a plan. I want to work with your team. I want to see myself as an extension of your team, and I want to put together a plan that makes sense for your team. And this is really important. The last, this last, I say this is everything is really important, but this I think is critical. How much of your time, team's time is going to be dedicated to this project? I know if, if, I, if somebody says I have a project manager on a quarter million dollar project and 15% of their time is scheduled on this, I know that's a red flag. I know that in my pro pro proposal, I need to point this out as something that needs to be addressed. Conversely, if I know, if, if I see that there's a developer that's going to be on this project 80% of the time, I know that I can reduce the budget on the project because I can rely on internal sprinting resources which actually brings me to the uh, another point here which is never share your budget which of course i am an agency i am absolutely joking uh absolutely share your budget and let me there's a lot of reasons why you should do this if you can whenever i think of putting together a project plan i think of the iron triangle of project management the scope budget and timeline Knowing the scope, budget, and timeline of a project, I can now determine what the quality of this project is going to be. Now, if I have a lot of, a lot of budget and a little bit of timeline, I can uh, adjust the scope accordingly. If I have a lot of scope, and a lot of budget, and a lot of time, I'm gonna make some recommendations based on that. I need to know this. If I don't know the budget, I just don't understand what is uh, appropriate in terms of scope and timeline. But it's not just about me. Why share the budget? First, it helps you right size project plans and the proposals. If you are a publishing platform and you do have a million dollars to build it with, you do not want to see a proposal that says go to medium. It's not a good use of your time. So sharing the budget actually puts, it puts a plan in front of you that fits the budget that you have. And the second is that it allows you to judge on the quality of the plan and the experience of the team, not the price. Again, we are not selling, you know, it, it's, this is a creative endeavor. Agencies don't sell the same widget. 
agencies, each agency is built a little bit differently and you wanna make sure that you're judging on their experience and quality. And by taking, sharing the budget, you're taking price out of the equation. You do an apples to apples comparison. And lastly, I, I, I do debrief it, debriefs with all of my clients afterward. And I can tell you the clients that share their budgets in the RFP get a lot more responses than the ones that don't. Ultimately, many agencies don't respond to RFPs that don't share the budget because they don't know if the budget is adequate. I'll give you a, a, a recent example. I've done two debriefs recently, both on a quarter million dollar project. One of them shared their budget, had 22 responses. The other didn't share their responses, they didn't share their budget, had two responses. So I just really, it's in your best interest to share the budget. Okay, those are all my, that's all the advice I have. Let's do the takeaways. First, don't use the RFP process if you can help it. But if you must, write an amazing RFP. Here are the sections that I would recommend that you include in your RFP. First, summary, overview. What's the purpose of this RFP? I wanna make sure I understand what, what I'm responding to. Secondly, organizational background. Who are you? What purpose? What's your mission? What are your values? You know, uh, set, third, project background. What are your goals? What do you know about your audience? What are your analytics telling you? Next, submission requirements, contacts, deadlines, scoring metrics. Um, the, the deadlines uh, deadlines are often kept uh, are, are often shared. The contacts are somewhat shared, and the scoring metrics are rarely shared. You should always share all of them. Uh, the next is team information. Who is on your team? How much of their time is on a project? What are their abilities? What are they bringing? The scope of work include the iron triangle, what the scope is, the expected deliverables, the timeline, and the budget. And with respect to boilerplate, use appendices, skip it, or separate it by using appendices. That is actually the entirety of my talk. I was super adrenalized for this uh, conversation. So I have uh, a lot of time for questions. Great, thanks Joe. Um, yeah, this is a great time for questions. If you have any, please throw them in the Q&A. Uh, if any pop up too while we're discussing, feel free to share them in there. Joe, if you're ready, I think I've got a question for you. Sure, I'm still having some video issues here, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, of course. So that first question I have for you is, the opening slides mentioned agile software development and waterfall. What are these things? What do they mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry about that. So, um, uh, so these are uh, organizational principles around digital projects. Um, waterfall refers to basically loading up all of the requirements of a project at the very beginning of a project and then you know, the, the, the metaphor I've used, you load up all the requirements into a boat, you put the boat on the water and you go over the waterfall with it. You basically, you're committed to these requirements. Agile is, uh, is, is much more of, a, of, of having a very clear picture of what the next two or four weeks of the project look like and more of an open-ended idea of where this project is going. The reason why Agile works for software better than waterfall is that software is ephemeral. It, it doesn't actually have a, a form, it's not tangible until it takes shape as a piece of working software. And so you're not gonna really know all of the requirements that that software needs to have until you've built it, until you've tested it with your users, you've put it in front of people and gotten feedback. So uh, Waterfall, the, the, the benefit of Waterfall is the certainty of knowing what you're gonna launch with. But the downside is you might launch with something that's not useful. The benefit of Agile is launching with something useful. And the downside that needs to be mitigated is the risk that needs to be mitigated is that you, you want to make sure that you have a clear picture of how the budget is going to be allocated, even if you don't have a totally clear picture of how of all of the requirements of the project, because those requirements are going to reveal themselves as the project unfolds. And you know, it, it's it's the the proof is in the pudding. Agile projects are far more likely to be successful. Perfect. And hopefully that answered your question. All right. I mean, it looks like we've got one more. 
And if you have one that comes up, feel free to throw it in the Q&A section. This one says, I have a large group of stakeholders with competing interests. Can you talk about maybe some of the strategies you have seen employed to help align these groups? That's a, that's a really, really good question. Um, we work with a lot of uh, organizations that have large stakeholder groups and one and diverse stakeholder groups. So think about uh, the work we did with HRW, Human Rights Watch, um, <clears throat> uh, 51 stakeholder groups in every time zone across the globe. Uh, all of them have competing interests. The stakeholders will have a, the stakeholders will have interest in aspects of your project. If I am the events coordinator at my organization, I'm gonna be super interested in the events part of the platform. If I am an executive sponsor, I'm gonna be super interested in making sure this thing launches on time. If I am, you know, and so on. If I'm in marketing, I wanna make sure that the, the if, uh, if I'm in marketing at a, a, a nonprofit, I wanna make sure that the donate and sign up the newsletters are really prominent. Getting these stakeholders into alignment is something that needs, should happen before the project starts. And I don't mean like perfect alignment, everybody uh, is, is seeing things exactly the same way. What I mean is, is that they understand what the priorities are for the organization. And what's, what I've seen successfully employed is uh, a, a client, what, uh, one of our clients uh, works in a major university and she had to organize, is a large, like many large universities, is loosely federated series of departments, units and programs. And she needed to get a bunch of departments, units, programs in alignment on her project. So what she did was she got everybody in a room. And she wrote down all, she had, at first she had interviewed all of them and gotten their requirements. And then as a follow-up, she got everybody in a room and wrote all of their requirements. And she'd written all of their requirements on index cards and put those index cards on a wall. And then basically allowed everyone in the room five votes to say, these are the things, you tell me your top five priorities and people would just put little stickers on those index cards. And so you could see the index cards that had five stars on it, or like stars that just like a bunch of stars, that went straight to the top of the list. And this, the index cards that had no, none, that went into the backlog. It was very, it made it very easy for all of the stakeholders to, take a, to step back from their role on the project and take a larger view of the project. That's uh, one strategy. Another strategy I've seen, and this is something that's been done, um, what we've done during a project is when stakeholders need to come back into alignment during, during the course of engagement, uh, a town hall is really helpful. Uh, just uh, again, it's, it's one of those things where uh, the work of your project is not gonna be super visible to all of your stakeholders. And making that work visible is gonna, again, make it a priority. It's gonna make it important for your organization, and that's going to reduce risk in your project and increase the chances of a really successful outcome. I don't think I see any more questions. Are, any, uh, are there any other, any other questions out there that may, uh, anybody wanna raise their hand uh, in, the, in the list of people? All right, well, I'm gonna... Uh... Perfect. Yeah, and um, just want to say thank you, Joe, for a great session. And if anyone does come up with any questions or thinks of something they want to discuss after this webinar, feel free to reach out and to connect with us. We'll definitely um, connect with you and answer those questions. Uh, last, uh, last few things just to follow up. Uh, we will be sending out a follow-up email with the recorded session of this um, webinar. So that way you can go back, use it however you would like, as well as a survey that will only take about a few minutes to fill out. Essentially, we just really want to understand how we can improve these webinars uh, for you and for future audiences. So we'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out for us. And then last thing I have for us is to save the date. Our next webinar is coming up on May 27th by our senior designer, Roxy Coranda. Uh, it's called Design for Non-Designers. It's a fantastic session, especially for organizations that experience uh, budget limitations or lack of design knowledge and have a lot of design needs and don't know where to start. Really great session. So just head to atten.io.io webinars and that'll be a great place to register. But I believe that is all we have for you today. So thank you again for joining us and we really appreciate it. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.